Hello everybody, welcome to this week's Astro Coffee Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell, I run deepastronomy.space, and boy, today I am really excited about today's Hangout. We're going to be talking about the 40th anniversary of the Voyager 1 and 2 spacecraft as they flew, uh, their, uh, their missions began 40 years ago this year, and while we were supposed to do this Hangout a month ago, I kind of had this little hurricane thing to deal with, and so we rescheduled it for this month and so we the guests today are outstanding i'm very excited to uh to introduce my guest to you uh to who's going to talk about this mission as they are just you know if if you've got any questions whatsoever about voyager this is the time to ask them uh but before i do that i want to uh let everybody know that i am streaming on youtube facebook twitter twitch and all of these places and i'm looking at the uh i'm looking at the various um uh, live chats and on YouTube, I'm seeing a lot of the old, my old favorites. Hi, John. Hi, Galaxia and Adam Synergy's there. Susan Hunter. Uh, lots of other people are here. So uh, please, I hope you guys will interact with us as the uh, Hangout con progresses and talk about the Voyager spacecraft. So to get started, let me bring up my co-host, uh, Dr. Carol Christian, who makes these, who helps put these together each week. Hi, Carol. It's good to see you again. Hey. How are you? Yeah, nice to see you. Yeah. Glad you've recovered from the hurricane. Gosh. I know. Yeah, it was. Uh, it was very. It was interesting, to say the least. But yeah, thank you, guys. And I'm also glad we were able to reschedule uh, for this. Uh, this yeah, month. really. So, yeah. Anyway, so tell us a little bit about these hangouts. Give us an intro into uh, what we are doing here. Our two guests are very hard. To, our two guests are hard to pin down. <laughs> they're very busy people, so we're really happy they're here. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do you want to talk about the hangout? The I do. Oh, you tell so, us what, what you uh, know, who sponsors it, things like that. Sure. Afternoon Astronomy Coffee is sponsored by the American Astronomical Society and the American Astronautical Society, and the idea is to have an informal chat. Um, with the researchers, scientists, and engineers who are doing the real research. And more, I mean, beyond a lecture, it's really to talk about what were the motivations, what did they find, what are they, what are they thinking, and what are they going to do in the future. So that's what we're going to find out all about Voyager. So it's an exciting hangout today. Yeah, good. So, yeah, and we want to thank the uh, AASs for making, uh, giving us this uh, <laughs> opportunity to do these hangouts. Okay, so let me introduce my guest today. In the upper right, up, or up, in the upper left of the screen is, by the way, this is the onslaught of the University of Colorado. These guys are in, they are both from my alma mater, and I'm excited to, to enter, to have these guys with us, with me. And I have to tell you, you know, I was thinking about this before we started, when I tell you what these guys have worked on, it's really quite astonishing. And the upper right is Dr. Fran Bagenal. Uh, she has she's interested primarily in magnetic fields of planets, but she but she's working. Uh, she has worked on all kinds of missions in the past. She was in addition to Voyager. She's also worked on the uh, Galileo mission to Jupiter. She's also been involved. In, she's currently involved in the New Horizons mission as well as the. Uh, a Juno mission around Jupiter, and uh, really just an, a, all around, just worked in all the coolest missions you could think of. Welcome, Fran. It's good to have you here. Hi. <laughs> and also, on a personal note, Fran gave me my first job in in um, in in physics, and so I just want to. This is ex especially exciting for me. Aww. Uh, so thank you, Fran. Uh, also, uh, down in the, the toward the in the bottom of the square, there is uh, Dr. Larry Esposito. He's a professor. The, both of these guys work at the Laboratory for Astrophysics. Back up, Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics (LASP) in the University of Colorado. And Dr. Larry Esposito is. Uh, uh, also joining us, and he has uh, uh, worked on also a, a great number of missions, including most recently, I think, the Cassini spacecraft uh, mission. He's also worked as a member of the Pioneer Saturn imaging team, uh, and he's actually used the Hubble Space Telescope, according to your biography, Larry, uh, for the first observations of the planet Venus. So, uh, if you, these guys have been, if you, the, when it comes to planetary exploration, we've got the, we've got the people here. So anyway, welcome, Larry. It's good to have you with us. Happy to be here. Okay. So let's start, I guess, by talking about, 
Uh, and Fran, I'll start with you. What was, you want to give us just a very brief, most people are very familiar with Jupiter, but maybe, I mean, I'm sorry, uh, Voyager, but maybe give us a brief overview of the, of the missions and what their intent was. So the idea was to go out and explore the outer solar system. The pioneers had gone out, the two pioneers, spacecraft 10 and 11, had gone out past uh, the asteroid belt and through past Jupiter. And their main job was to show that it could be done because nobody knew that you could go through the asteroid belt and survive. And they showed that it could be done. And so then the obvious thing to do would be to follow this on with a mission that would go and do some science with modern technology. Now, what also happened at this time, which is very important, is a young man who was working at Caltech noticed that the planets would be almost aligned up in a way that you could actually go using a gravity assist, and we can come back to how that works later, but you would get an assist at Jupiter to go to Saturn, assist at Saturn to go to to Uranus, and then at Uranus to go to Neptune. So you'd be able to do all of the four uh, giant planets in one go, fly past each one after the other, which was a great observation. And indeed, that is exactly what Voyager did. Um, uh, so they were launched 40 years ago in 1977. And then um, they did a series of flybys with Voyager 2 was the only one that actually went on to Uranus and Neptune. But Voyager 2 uh, went past all four and uh, past um uh, Neptune in September of 1989, just as I was teaching my first classes here at the University of Colorado. <laughs> and um, then it's gone out, uh, both of them have gone out um, to the outer reaches of our solar system and into interstellar space. So fantastic uh, opportunity to take really the first close-up views of these giant planets and told us so much about the planets and their moons. Yeah, and um, I learned, I think, when I was I was doing some, some background research on some of the early parts of the mission, and this was actually going to be a part of the Mariner program. Uh, Mar it was going to be initially named Mariner 11 and 12, but they moved it back to, they called the renamed it the Voyager program because they thought that the design of the two space groups had, the, two, the spacecraft had pr progressed enough that they could move on past the Mariner um, yeah. sort of there's, thing. There's also a certain amount of... Um, politics associated with rebranding when maybe a new person comes into office and you want to get more money or all this sort of stuff. And I was a graduate student at the time. Maybe Larry knows, but I, I didn't follow those details. And um, once it was launched, it was called, or about to be launched, it was uh, Jupiter Saturn, Mariner Jupiter Saturn and became Voyager. So Fran is exactly right. Lots of times um, programs and missions are redirected right. under some new strategic plan and strategic goals, you know, to respond to community interest. And uh, sometimes it's the same mission <laughs> under a different name. So I wanted to add one problems. interesting mission that, of course, NASA noticed that a mission could go to all four of the giant planets, but that request was turned down. And the Voyager mission was just designed to go to Jupiter and Saturn. And particularly Voyager 1 was designed to take a close-up look at Titan and so if Voyager 1 had failed in that objective, Voyager 2 would have been redirected to assure a good look at Titan, which would have um, removed the possibility of going on to Uranus and Neptune. So the mission had been scaled back for cost reasons, and uh, it was basically about Jupiter, Saturn, and Titan. And when we successfully, even after the successful flybys of Voyager 1 and 2 with Saturn, there's still a question of whether the mission would be extended. And the head of the Office of Management and Budget was the opinion that the mission should not be extended. It was not worth the cost, even though, as Fran said, because of celestial mechanics, the Voyager 2 spacecraft was flying now and would encounter the planet Neptune and then later Uranus without another dollar being spent just by the laws of gravity. So there was some discussion of the mission would be ended and we would resolutely turn off our radio telescopes and not listen to the information or look at any of the pictures that came from Voyager when it flew by Uranus and Neptune. Luckily, wiser heads prevailed. <laughs> no kidding. What a waste that would have been. You're right there <laughs> and you're just, nope, we're not going to listen. I'm sorry. It's not, uh, it's not going to happen. So do we, what did the, I mean, 
I think Voyager is all is often used as when it comes to uh, the overall you know bang for your buck kind of thing that NASA has. This one was sort of I've always used it as an example of you know really getting a lot for your money. Do you remember how much the mission was co- was was projected to cost? Does anybody know that it was like it was, it was in the several, couple hundred millions? I think. Well, of course, numbers are a little bit difficult to I know. compare because it, there was a lot of inflation back then. So, you know, comparing <laughs> numbers is really hard. Um, but uh, it was, you know, if you were to compare, um, it, you know, it was basically a few. It's it's about the same cost as 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 all of these kind of large strategic missions. It's a a billion, few billion each you know depending on what numbers you use and how what you count and don't count and so on and so forth but that you know that's what a strategic mission usually costs and voyager it got a lot of bang for its buck because it was the first one going there right i mean (laughs) so you know if you're going to do more things which is what you have to do with a follow-on mission then that will take more resources so if you look at the technology of what cassini has done at saturn it's unbelievable very high quality instrumentation and so on and there for a long time and making lots of observations of course cassini ended up being much more expected more expensive than than voyager but bang for your buck it gets to be a little difficult to to do that kind of accounting right so So from a personal point of view what fran says about being the first space mission to go to these planets saturn uranus and neptune that was but personally, an incredible experience because every day you got up and the mission was closer to Saturn and the pictures were better than yesterday's pictures. And then tomorrow they would be better for today. And, for example, we were counting the number of rings. People said, how many rings are around Saturn? Well, there was one day there was one number. The next day we were closer. We saw more rings. The number just kept going up. And this was an amazing experience for months we would see something every day that had not been visible the day before. And then this happened again at Uranus and at Neptune. What an experience. It's, it's not possible to reproduce the experience of being the first person to see something, even from a, a spacecraft, the first person to notice something because the spacecraft has gotten into that environment, has gotten close enough to measure something we had never known or seen before. And and so we've had that again with New Horizons at Pluto. And I totally agree with Larry. This The first sight, first glimpses of these weird worlds are all totally different than we expected. Always tends to be the case. <laughs> um, is fantastic. And you can't beat that. So bang for your buck, is a, is, it's a little difficult to... to quantify okay well let's talk a little bit about what voyager had on it so i've got this app up that you guys are watching me play with this as they're as they're talking about the mission uh this is called nasa's eyes on uh the solar system they have a special tour uh for the voyager anniversary and on it is uh uh lots of things you can play with but in this particular case i've got the spacecraft up here and um can you guys talk a little bit about some of the instruments that was on here and maybe comment on which one because i know the university of colorado operated or built an instrument for voyager maybe talk about that uh fran can you start um so i was involved in the plasma instrument and um that is up 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 at the top of that you've got that um oh dear how do i explain it you've got the um instrument boom sticking out that has the cameras on the very end okay uh-huh. there so it is. Is there that it? is that it plasma instrument. that's it that's okay. it and uh, that was the one that i worked on and it's an instrument that's built at mit and it detected the low energy charged particles the plasma that's trapped in the magnetic field of jupiter that's flying uh, that's that's in the magnetosphere, and we flew through it, and we measured that. Now, if you go, Larry we can come back and talk about the other instruments on the boom, but if you go for a minute to the opposite side of the spacecraft, okay, and you will see that there's this very, very, very long boom sticking all the way out, oh, and up. on the end of that, there are two magnetometers, and Here? outboard, yeah, that's it. Okay. Yeah, very, very long boom at the end. 
And that was sort of that wire mesh. It sort of springs out and takes the instruments away from the spacecraft. And the reason why we had to do that is you don't want to measure the um, currents, the magnetic field associated with currents that are flowing in the instrument because instrument has got a lot of stuff happening in it electronically. And so we would go to the, we would have the um, uh, magnetometer out on a boom uh, away from the spacecraft. And then also um, there were two long um, antennas that you can see sticking down and uh, mm -hmm. out at angles. And those uh, measured the plasma waves. So they measured electric fields and uh, magnetic fields associated with radio waves and plasma waves and so on. And those were very important, again, for understanding the physics of what's going on in the magnetic field. And so while we're also there, let me point out this big thing sticking out there near the um, magnetometer, which is the RTGs, the radio oh, yeah. isotope thermo, that's it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Radio isotope thermoelectric generator, which won't be under science instruments, but that was the source of power. And maybe we can come back and talk about that later. There it is. Yeah, there, there it is. Yeah, the, this yeah. is what gave the power to uh, these spacecraft. And yeah, I want to go back to this because there's some interesting stuff to talk about. Right. But uh, basically, this has got plutonium in it that is just basically using the heat to generate electricity. Uh, for the spacecraft, which you need in deep space because solar panels don't work so great. Although Juno was using them, right, Fran? But we'll, I know that's a different topic. But <laughs> well, there's a to lot go to go where Voyager went. You need to use plutonium. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So Larry, what so about maybe what... Larry can tell you about the other instruments, the remote yeah. sensing instruments? Sure. So uh, Voyager used a very clever idea. It put all of the remote sensing instruments, the telescopes, at the end of a long boom and it could turn that boom to look at anything of interest. So that was a very clever idea that we didn't follow through on Cassini. On Cassini, all the cameras are attached to the spacecraft. So if you want to look at something, you have to turn the whole spacecraft. And that means the experiments like the ones that Fran was talking about are probably looking at nothing interesting in that case on Cassini. But on Voyager, we could look and take photographs and make measurements at the same time we were measuring the environment around the spacecraft. So, so does that mean this was gimbaled? Bang for the buck. Was this Go gimbaled? Ahead. Is that what that means? That you were able to yes. point this around? Okay. Right. It is gimbaled. And so it was independent of the antenna, which could always be pointing at the Earth to transmit our pictures, and independent of the other experiments that might want to be in a different location or a different uh, viewing direction. And on there, you can see our experiment from Colorado, the photopolarimeter subsystem looks like a little coffee can. Maybe that was not such a good idea. It has a shade on top of it, which was supposed to protect us from the sun. Although during the mission, it instead of being called the sun shade, we often called it the sun scoop. It collected <laughs> uh, That part provided some static and some uh, uh, background of Saturn's rings and later the rings of Uranus and Neptune. I was going to say that if people want to Google Voyager, you can find voyager.jpl.nasa.gov slash mission and you can find this 3D tool, which is uh, works very well and is well annotated in case you want to play with it. And of course, all the instrument information. And so Voyager had there. two cameras as well. And of course, as we've said, they were the best. They were in the right place. They gave the best pictures ever. And, you know, from the retrospective of Cassini now, the cameras are better, but there's nothing to replace the thrill when we were in the right place to see the first ever pictures of these planets, their moons, and their rings. Okay, yeah, so um, what is this a... Um, this this imaging, th this is one camera here. This Is, is this another one up here? Yes, there's a okay. wide angle, that's the little one, and the narrow angle camera for the close-up pictures. So it's like a telephoto lens, except with only two settings. And what is this thing What is this thing here, off to the side? Do you know? What, or, I'm sure you do. But... I'm sorry, that's, oh yeah, that's the infrared, uh, infrared spectrograph. Oh, okay. Called Iris. And so that is looking in the infrared. There's also uh, an ultraviolet experiment. So infrared, ultraviolet, both invisible to the human eye, but full of information. <laughs> It was useful in understanding the planets and the cameras, which gave us the great pictures 
And our experiment built and operated here at Colorado, the photopolarimeter system, which measured the brightness and polarization of light uh, from all of the objects of interest. Okay. So that common payload of four different remote sensing investigations, all of the telescopes were aligned. So whenever the cameras looked at something, we were looking at it too. Was a was a brilliant idea for providing a broad range, a whole spectrum of information about whatever target we were looking at at the moment. I okay. want to say one more thing about sure. Voyager, which was it was incredibly fast. The mission got to Jupiter quickly, but it also flew the planets very quickly in less than a day. So we would plan for years for those very few moments when the spacecraft would fly by the planet, turning rapidly to look at one thing and another, make a measurement, and then on for another few years of waiting until we got to the next planet where there were, once again, a few weeks of anticipation and a few days of close-up in- images and a few hours of spectacular discoveries. Yeah, so here's what you're talking about. Here's Voyager 1 going by Jupiter. It's all happening really fast. I mean, you can see it just zipping through there. So I can imagine you guys uh, getting really tense uh, as this flyby approaches uh, and then uh, uh, just, you know, hoping everything runs right. So you you said this how, this lasted how long when it flew by? So the closest approach was about 24 hours. <laughs> That's incredible. So here we can see with uh, Voyager 1 at Jupiter, it passed very close to the moon Io right there, uh, and then very quickly whipped around Ganymede and then Callisto. Europa, not so much with Voyager 1, but there's the path that it took when it flew by. Fran, what were what were you doing when this was happening? Were you like riveted are you were you at jpl were you at the university no 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 i was at um well for 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 jupiter i was at goddard space flight center in uh maryland oh Um, okay particles and fields their data was sent directly there and um i was hanging out there and i had written a paper on what we would see at jupiter as we flew through the taurus this was my graduate student qualifying exam paper or whatever you call it. And um, I had said, based on ground-based observations, telescopic observations of the region around EO, that we would expect to see this very cold material of sulfur and oxygen ions that would be very cold. And so as a spectrum, what you would see as a function of energy would be these, these things, peaks sticking up in the spectrum. And uh, when we were arriving, the UV instrument said, oh, no, it's going to be very hot. You're not going to see them, that that you will have. There was a big debate about whether the plasma was hot or cold or what we would see, dense or not dense. And uh, I remember being at Goddard. And in those days, one thing we have to talk about is the technology. The technology was very crude. We were using punch cards. No way. Mag tape. <laughs> oh, yeah. We were writing in Fortran 66 and all this sort of stuff. And um, yeah. Fortran uh, 66. Oh, my gosh. That does go back. We, we were using very old technology. And um, we saw this printer printed out the data. So it was one of these printers that um, the paper comes through in, 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 in rolls. And a little inkjet would go like this across the, the paper and your data would come out. And for Larry, there's a fabulous picture of the data from the photopolarimeter going past, which looking at the star going through the rings. And you this long strip of about 30, 40 feet of paper that these guys are all pouring over looking at this ink going all over these things. Anyway, I was looking at this. The, the printer was churning out the data from the instrument that I was working on. And I saw these things that I had predicted starting to stick up, these spectral signatures. And I was like, yes! I knew I had a, I knew I had a thesis then. <laughs> oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh, of the two flybys, that's which one, right. for you, Fran, which one was the most scientifically, were they both equally interesting and was one better than the other, Voyager 1 or Voyager 2 as it flew by oh. Jupiter? Well, for, for me, it was very much Voyager 1 okay. um, because we went in closer. We went in close to Io. Io is the pesky moon 
spews out volcanic volcanic gas, like sulfur and oxygen that fills up the <laughs> magnetosphere. It's the one where you have very strong electrical currents flowing around through the atmosphere and to the planet, generating aurora and all sorts of... Re we knew from the 60s because of the radio emission that we detected here on Earth, that EO triggers bursts of radio emission. So we knew all the way along that EO was going to be important and exciting, and indeed it delivered. It, it, really, it really did. I remember yeah. all the pizza references too, you know. Oh, how the, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all the posters of this big pizza uh, yeah. in orbit around Jupiter. Uh, so Larry, because of your work you know, on Cassini and, and things, was, was, the Cassini, was the Saturn flyby more interesting for you, or were they, whoa. Oh, you've got that lovely picture. Oh, there Fabulous. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. So, uh, so where's Paul Le Roth where is the is the guy in, in the front with the white shirt. He was the head of the lab here at LASP and he was head of that instrument, I think. And he, he was uh, really got LASP going. He was the yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Okay. So, yeah. Of course, I was I was here at Colorado uh, waiting for the data to come over the uh, the uh, telephone lines and Charles Barth did call me up and said don't worry later Larry the data does get better um, <laughs> so let me just point out top right for those of you who are sky and telescope fans and you may have sky and telescope fans in the audience here oh, yes. um, Kelly Beatty who's the editor of sky and telescope oh, yeah. is up the top right there of this picture Wow. Yes. I, I can't point to it, but he, okay. I, can you ha can you highlight him, Carol? The one in the very top right. Well, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Okay. There he you is. You got the idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So during the uh, Jupiter well, encounter, well, of course, I was uh, during the whole approach. We were having meetings to plan the Saturn encounter. You know, serious arguments about where the spacecraft should go and where <laughs> it's pointing, and invariably these arguments were interrupted completely when a new picture of Jupiter would appear on the screen. There were windowless rooms quite suitable for these sorts of discussions, but they had a TV in them showing the latest downloaded images from Jupiter. And that would invariably stop all discussion. People would stop arguing about what they wanted to do at Saturn to go crowd around the camera and look closely at the moon Eo or Ganymede. So that's my recollection of the approach and the, of course, uh, it was such an experience to be there watching the data come down at the Jet Propulsion Lab, something that we're still doing in exactly the same room when the Cassini mission ended just a month ago. That's right, yeah. And uh, we need to have uh, so many hangouts with you guys. I'm going to talk about Cassini's final days as well. And so, But but talk a little bit about your work, Larry, on Voyager. And which, I, I was asking you about which flyby you were more interested in, the one with Jupiter or the one with Saturn. I know they were both interesting. But, I mean, which, which were you gearing up for the most? Well, definitely Saturn. That had been the topic of my Ph.D. thesis. And we were able to use some of these special techniques that we developed for the Colorado experiment at Saturn. So that was first the approach, and then later on, the actual data that we had gotten from the flyby. And of course, like Fran's data, a lot of our information comes just as she was describe, describing as a squiggly line. But I had realized when we had done the flyby of Pioneer 11 of Saturn, that uh, people weren't, the public and the press, and even some of the fellow scientists weren't that interested in those squiggly lines. So we had developed a way to turn those wiggles into pictures. So particularly from the Saturn flyby, we turn our squiggly line, which you just saw in that little picture on that piece of paper that was in front of Barth and Kelly Beatty and Jonathan Eberhardt, we turn that into a color picture. Of course, the colors were artificial, false, but that uh, picture showed what you would see in Saturn's rings if you had been as close to it as Voyager and seeing the detail that we were able to see from the stellar occultation. And that had, uh, was a great satisfaction to turn some of these um, abstruse measurements into visuals that people could relate to. Oh, okay, that's so. So, I'm, I, as you were talking, I'm showing both uh, Voyager one and two at Saturn, uh, and uh, as we saw earlier, Voyager one flew right by Titan, very close. Uh, Voyager two um, 
is coming through and also didn't quite get as close to Titan, but um, flew close to some of the other moons. It, this does happen fast. Um, look how close it gets to, uh, to the Enceladus right there. It's really... Uh, so were there any... Um, I guess I'd like to ask you both about any... Was there any things about these flybys that just uh, completely surprised you? Things that you weren't anticipating? I'll start with you, Fran. Well, um, we were not... Um we were not expecting the moons to be quite so varied. I mean, I think that's true for all of the planets. Each planet delivered just amazing moons. Uh, would these things were dots before Voyager? Um, we had some information, a little bit about EO, a little bit about Titan from ground-based telescopes tiny bits about the other moons not very much hints more than anything else and then we flew by and saw just incredible things and and maybe just as an example the last planet neptune we flew past triton and we saw bizarre surfaces that were ice that had funny shapes looked like a cantaloupe skin <laughs> we had black geysers shooting out into the above the moon. Really weird. I we had no idea what was going on. Strange patches on it. And um now that we've flown past Pluto, we're like, oh, similarities and differences with what we see on, on Triton. These are sister sister objects, if you like. But you know, we were sort of used to our moon and our moon is a piece of rock with impacts and not a lot going on. And these other moons around the solar system were extraordinary. Larry, do you have a, do you have anything that took you by surprise? So uh, each of the ring systems was different. And of course, with Voyager, we saw all four of the ring systems, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune close up. Some things were so surprising that the camera team leaders said they violated the laws of physics. It turns out maybe there are more solutions to the laws of physics than we had imagined, but there were things that were so unexpected that they we, we had thought they were impossible. Like what? Well, can, can you give us an example? So uh, what he made that particular comment about was the uh, effering of Saturn, which we had discovered on Pioneer just two years earlier, and the parts of that ring crisscrossed each other. They were wiggles that went underneath and across each other, totally unexpected. Gay and Wilson compared it to the freeways in Los Angeles. Said, Come on, scientists, you know what we're seeing. And uh, we hadn't expected that those uh, parts of planetary rings could apparently intersect, wiggle, cross underneath each other. At Neptune, we saw that the rings were hyphenated. Whoever ordered that, that, some places around the circle, there would be a ring. Other places, there would be nothing. So this was another uh, surprise to us. Um, the rings that were not circular, that were elliptical, all of these things were shown clearly in the pictures. And they caused us not only to be surprised, but actually to rethink the physics and the origin of those structures. Okay, so I, I want to um, go to a couple of uh, topics we sort of glanced over a little bit. I want to come back to the plutonium um, issue uh, of the RPG of the uh, radio. Uh, what are they called? Radio thermo RTGs, radioisotope thermoelectric generators. Thank you, friend. You yes, all the radio um, radioactive power systems. Right, and these are powered now. I, I'm trying to find the the numbers, but I think these both of these spacecraft were designed to run at about 600 watts or something like that. It, it started off at about that level, and of course, it decays with time because the uh, isotopes have a half life of about 88 years, and so by now, here we are, 40 years out. You know, there's a considerable less, and they're looking now like 200 watts 
less than that now going out and that will be the limiting system because you can't power the the ante- the uh, radio system to communicate with the earth and so at some point we will maybe 20 years who nobody really knows when we'll stop being able to communicate but they're going to have to limit the use of the different instruments as it moves away um, from earth um, it's now they're now at 120 130 i forget the exact number astronomical units so distance between the earth and the sun so four times at least the distance to pluto a long way out there hard to communicate very cold right and uh the um well here i can just i can put this up right now in fact if i put this up you could see that they are this 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 is nasa's website on the mission status it tells you where they are distance oh, from excellent. Earth. yeah 140 au like you said for voyager one and 115 for voyager two uh but the uh these rtgs they they use the heat from plutonium 238 to generate their electricity and this is important because there's not a whole lot of other energy sources out in the deep space to power these things so they're quite important and as fran mentioned they also um they also uh, d- decay and so they're not putting out as much heat as they did when they first started um, and so what I found interesting about this is I was reading and getting ready for this hangout I ran across an article that said that NASA is basically starting starting to have a plutonium problem um, was Cassini by the way Larry let me just stop Cassini had RTGs too right yes three RTGs right and so these this plutonium 238 is hard to make and it's highly regulated and there isn't a lot of it and nasa has currently about 77 pounds of this stuff 35 kilograms and of that only about half of that stockpile is still fresh and hot enough for nasa to use it on spacecraft and this is having an effect isn't it guys on mission planning going forward nasa needs to get more of this stuff somehow so, so there... it's, a, it's, a, it's a complicated story and um, because it involves the Department of Energy, who actually are responsible for making it. And so then there's the issue of who are the customers. And it used to be there were many more customers, particularly the Department of Defense. <laughs> then no longer as interested. Uh, and so the main customers for this is, in fact, the outer solar system exploration. And so NASA and the people who are interested in doing outer solar system exploration, not just outer solar system, but I'm sure as Larry will chime in to go to Venus, you will or on the surface where it's extremely hot, you would need some kind of power to cool the spacecraft too. So we need them if we're doing very tough missions. And so um, this means you've got to make it. You make it through a series of, this isn't bomb plutonium, by the way, this is plutonium 238, not 239. And it is um, made in uh, reactors. And um, the Department of Defense does this with nuclear reactors around the country. And there are places where they do this very carefully, very difficult. And yes, plutonium is nasty stuff to work with. Absolutely no question about it. But if we want to have a source of power in the outer solar system or in tough places like the surface of Venus, you need to have this source of power. And we know how to do it. And um, we can do it by making it. You have to make it and react from Neptunium that decays and mix it up and so on and so forth. And um, uh, there's a limited amount available. Now, uh, since the end of the Cold War, NASA has worked with, uh, we've worked with the Russians and we've, we've taken, we've gotten some stuff from Russia, but both Russia and um, the US are running out of this stuff at the right level of purity to do what we need with it. So there is a plan. In fact, it's starting up now up in Idaho. There's a um, the, um, the plant up there. They're starting to produce material that can be put together to make RTGs. But um, it's a very slow process, and they're not making very much uh, per year. And indeed, if we want to do the things at Mars, like go back and go and get a sample, or if you um, want to go to Uranus and Neptune, which you cannot do with solar power, you can just about go to Jupiter, as Juno is showing, with solar panels. But if you want to go to Uranus and Neptune, or if you want to do a Pluto mission, Pluto uh, and the Kuiper Belt, we went to Pluto and we used uh, plutonium-238 in a radioisotope thermoelectric generator to get there. So to do those challenging missions, we need more of this. 
Wow, and I thought this was an incredible issue. I did, I just stumbled on it doing the research for this hangout, so I just wanted to bring that up. And so I don't know. I never thought I'd be a proponent of this stuff. I mean, as you point out, it's not the bomb grade material, but it is pretty serious stuff. And so, but they need it. And so um, I hope they can get it. I don't know how this is affecting future missions or what's coming up for like Europa and those things that you were talking about. But hopefully, it can be worked. Yeah. Out. So the current plan is with Europa is to use solar panels, but um, is it okay? I have a lot of concerns about using solar panels that you want to keep pointed towards the sun on a spacecraft where you want to turn the spacecraft to point and look at and do imaging, very careful imaging of the surface. So it's a very tough, you know, there are some places where you can use solar panels. There are some places where you really just need that extra power source of uh, an RTG. Now, the, yeah, and an example is the the Juno spacecraft. You guys went through a lot of trouble to put it in that orbit. It needed to be in a polar orbit for science reasons, but also, you know, do you needed to orient it so that it was always pointing toward the sun, um, so that it would stay working the whole time? Right. And we actually have had to change the orbit. The orbit is it, it's a complicated issue, but with the orbit's changed a bit, and we're struggling right now with how do we keep the solar panels pointed towards the sun as best we can to keep that sun coming in. But sometimes you want to change the orientation to get better observations. And so um, we're struggling with that problem right now, how to optimize that. Okay. Uh, I want to get to some of the questions on the on, and comments that people are making. And I want to start with something. Let's just talk about where Voyager is, or the Voyager spacecraft are now. George Caldwell is asking, how do we know that the Voyagers have passed the heliosphere? Is there, no. a different, is there a difference between solar solar wind and interstellar wind at this boundary that can be detected yeah. or was transition more gradual? We just talked about it being 140 AU away. And what George is talking about is, why don't you first maybe tell us what a heliosphere is and then how do we know? Or right. So um, this has been a, a big sort of debate. It, and, and it's a bit like rediscovering water on Mars, you know, every year or two it's like oh we just found water on mars right it's the same a bit with the heliosphere we've entered into interstellar space no we haven't oh yes we just entered into interstellar space oh no we haven't oh yes we've, you know <laughs> it's the way science sometimes happens um so the heliosphere is the sphere of influence of the sun helios being the greek word the sun and so this is the sphere of influence the sun the the, the extent of the solar wind and the magnetic field of the sun and because the flow is supersonic, it's moving faster than the speed of sound, you end up with a shock, which is where on the inner side, actually, where the flow slows down and the plasma heats up, it goes out beyond that. But to actually reach interstellar space, you need to be the outer boundary. And that has been where the debate is. And it turns out that the reason why it isn't so obvious is that boundary is not sharp. It's a fuzzy boundary flows back and forth over the spacecraft, but also it looks as if the flow coming in from interstellar space, the nearby star sending out a wind that comes in, interacts with the bubble around our star, the sun, is uh, that boundary is not as simple as we thought. It turns out that it has deflect stuff around and that the shape of the bubble may not be like a comet, but it may be more like a sphere or maybe even even somewhat cylindrical in shape. And so with one spacecraft going through this boundary, you, it's a little hard to sort things out. <laughs> right. So people have compared that boundary not to a wall, but more like a flag flapping in the wind. So naturally, there's some dispute about whether we really made uh, the transition to the area outside the sun's influence. So what yeah. the the flag being like what variations in density or it would be like you're flying and through different speed, parts, yeah, w wafting back and forth over the spacecraft. The spacecraft's going through, and this thing is wafting past it. Does it? Ah, I see. Okay. Achilles three hundred eight is asking: Is Voyager still the fastest probe escaping our solar system? Uh, yes, its current speed out of the solar system is the fastest spacecraft. And, yes. And Paranoro 001 is commenting, the Voyagers are the only probes escaping our solar system. So <laughs> No, not true. Not ah. true. No. Pioneer 10 and 11 are escaping our solar system. We're not communicating with them anymore. And so is New Horizons, which flew past Pluto and will go past MU69, a second Kuiper Belt object, the end of next year. 
So um, there are all of these are these spacecraft are escaping our solar system. Okay, uh, when I want to ask George Caldwell's question, then I want to go back to, I want to go talk about the record for just a little bit. George Caldwell is asking, is Voyager speed substantial enough such that you need to account for relativistic effects during precise calculation of, for example, the position of the spacecraft? The answer is yes, <clears throat> but they have to be very precise calculations. And for example, when we were interpreting the star occultations of the stars as they pass behind the rings of the planet, we have to correct for relativistic effects. Okay, so according to this, as they're going about uh, 38,000 miles per hour for Voyager 1, 34,000 miles per hour for Voyager 2. So yeah, that's pretty That's pretty good. Uh, it's a pretty good clip. So good. All right, well, let's talk a little bit about the the record that they have on there. Now, one of the things that the mission planners had um, in mind it was a very um, interesting, which was they uh, wanted to include on it. Actually, hopefully, I can find it again. Um, a golden record on the side of the spacecraft. There it is. And this golden record was a time capsule of sorts. It was. It had instructions for uh, how to play the record. It even had a stylus on it, and it had encoded on it images and sounds and things like that. Um, and Voyagers 1 and 2, correct me if I'm wrong, these were the only spacecraft that, had, that we have done this with, isn't it? The pioneers also have records, uh, have not a record, but a, a plaque on them that describes something about where they're coming from. Okay. And um, what do you guys think of this? I mean, what are your opinion? Was this, was this a publicity stunt? Is it something that really um, is really important? Do you think that, I mean, for example, I guess I, you hear people like Stephen Hawking and others warning us that we probably shouldn't be telling people where we are. Uh, they may not be exactly friendly to us. Uh, what are your opinions? Oh, on this come thing? on. If, if, if anybody can look, find Voyager and look at the record, then they're probably intelligent enough to work out where it came from. I, <laughs> really, I don't think that's a big deal. That's the least of our problems. And don't forget, we've been sending out radio broadcasts, right, about our TV and radio you know, since the middle of last century, you know, they know about us. If they know, you know. Well, one of the things I did right. not know Chuck about. Theory is better than I Love Lucy is what yes. I said. In fact, <laughs> yes. on Saturday Night Live, uh, they said the, uh, the uh, aliens had found the Voyager and the first uh, message had come back. And as you said, it contains all of Earth's greatest hits, everything from Bach to Chuck Berry and the first message purportedly from the aliens was send more Chuck Berry. <laughs> Definitely. Um, okay, well, one thing I did not know about the record was that electroplated onto it is a ultra is an ultra pure source of uranium two thirty eight. Okay. Which so, is... Speaking of Chuck Berry, I just want to point oh. out that Chuck Berry actually was playing on the JPL stairs while while the Neptune encounter occurred. <laughs> that was a great performance. He sang "Go Voyage anyway. Go." <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, well, that is yeah. Thank you, Carol. Okay, so electric. So what's on this is a little tiny piece of U two thirty eight, which uh, they, based on its decay rate and everything else, they will tell them exactly whoever finds it uh, will be exact. You know how when this uh, spacecraft was launched, I I knew about the photos, I knew about the music, and I knew about the maps and stuff, but I did not know that there was also that little piece of uranium on there that based on its decay rate, you, the, the finder can tell exactly when the, um, when the spacecraft were launched. So I thought that was pretty cool. Okay, so let's see. Um, what based on right let's talk a little bit about the interstellar mission the 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 thing that we're hope what is Voyager teaching what are the Voyager spacecraft teaching us now? So the instruments that are working on um, the Voyager um, 1 spacecraft are basically the magnetometer and the energetic particle instruments and the plasma wave instrument. Uh, on Voyager 2, there's also the plasma instrument that I worked on, the low energy one, but that was not working on. Um, so PLS is off on Voyager 1, but it's on on Voyager 2. So these things measure the interstellar medium. So they're measuring the solar wind, 
and now into the interstellar medium, the interstellar plasma, charged particles, and magnetic field, and wave systems. And so this is really telling us about the medium, the space medium, very low densities, really low fields, and so on. And so this is telling us about how the, uh, the particles and the fields coming from the sun interact with the particles and the fields in interstellar medium. And this is telling us about uh, the interstellar medium is really telling us about the neighboring stars and the gases coming from the neighboring stars and um, the how that material flows in towards our, our solar system. And really, we've not been able to measure that locally before. There have been sort of very general measurements across very large areas of space, but now we're able to actually measure the local medium and what it's really like. And I have this schematic here from the Ison Voyager uh, app that shows where they are right now and where they're flying out of. And I just I put this up in response to uh, uh, something I saw a Adam Synergy say, which was uh, maybe Breakthrough Starship can take pics of Voyager on its way past. Uh, if we look at this, the 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 plane of the solar system, you could see where the two Voyager spacecraft are heading, and basically opposite directions. Are they heading anywhere near the nearest stars to us? Um. I think oh I boy! Heard, one of them will go towards Vega, I think. Um, but uh, this was something that I tried to remember recently, <laughs> and I and I I uh, did not register. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, that's yeah, that's that's something I can't remember either. But, but I, I don't think they're going anywhere near Alpha Centauri. I don't either. No, and that's where a Breakthrough yeah. Starship would be heading. So yeah, or Proxima right. Centauri. Sure. So. Yeah. So they probably won't Not. see each other, but anyway, this is a, a schematic of where they are now and how they're traveling out of our solar system and in the directions they're going through uh, right now. So that's really so that was um, something I that wanted to let you know about Ad, or Adam. Um, John Suffolk's copying should have been uh, Pink Floyd uh, Interstellar Overdrive. <laughs> uh, Pink Floyd is good, but Chuck Berry is is uh, the best. Uh, Galaxia wanted to know something uh, about the decision to not go to Pluto was oh, the, uh, it, not in the right place. It wasn't in the right place. So it couldn't no. have done that even if you wanted no. to. Okay. No. All right. So uh, if, if uh, Neptune had been a point source, there was a place you could fly to uh, go <laughs> back to Pluto. But if we tried to fly to that gravitational location, we would have hit the planet. So that was <laughs> not a possibility to go to Pluto. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Con Conrad uh, Blaley is or Bialy is uh, is commenting or asking why the influence of solar wind is is considered the end of the solar system. The sphere of influence of Earth uh, is not only yes. its atmosphere yes. but its gravitational dominance. Right. Absolutely. So um the the there are objects um many objects that extend much larger distances. And so particularly the recent objects that people have been talking about um, uh, extend to larger distances uh, beyond beyond this. So the Kuiper Belt, uh, which goes into about uh, 30 astronomical units outwards past the orbit of Pluto, beyond to about 50. There are a few more uh, that go out to several hundred AU, um, and the, those objects are still within the gravity of the Sun, yes. So they're in elliptical orbits, orbiting the sun, out there further. And, you know, there's this speculation that maybe there's a planet X that's out, out even further. Um, and so the gravity influence is much bigger. Okay, I'm interested in the solar wind and the charged <laughs> particles and the magnetic field. Um, I admit it. So that's why I use the heliosphere as my definition. Okay. Ivan Demet D Dmitriev, uh, hey, I have a question of the strategic nature. Do we still know how to manufacture radiation-hardened electronics, which can work over decades, like the ones in Voyager? See why we wouldn't. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, They're better. Uh, Adam Synergy is asking, are Voyager images of Uranus and Neptune the only close-ups we will see in our lifetimes? I hope not. Yeah. Maybe my lifetime, but maybe not his. I hope we will go back. I think there's a high priority. NASA has been em putting emphasis on Uranus and Neptune, and I think they are very high, high 
um, important targets for us to go back to. Well, so right now, uh, Fran- as well as Venus, by the way, I have to say that. Yes, and right now you're involved in Juno, which is the which is the current mission going on. And Larry, you've been involved in Cassini, which just finished its mission last month with the grand finale. What? Uh, what's next with planetary explanation exploration you're saying you said that you know venus is important do we have plans to go to venus uh what are the next and i've heard something about europa so i'll let Fran talk about europa but there definitely are studies of how to go to venus there's a joint study that nasa is running with the russian space agency for a joint mission involving lander and maybe a balloon going to venus And there are proposals that NASA has received about future Venus missions, which are now in review. And maybe before the end of the year, NASA will select one of those possible Venus missions for further study and possibly for flight to go to or land on Venus. Okay. So I'm going to just just chime in a second about venus i don't work on venus it doesn't have a magnetic field i have nothing in the race okay (laughs) but it's our sister planet more or less the same size of the earth greenhouse runaway atmosphere absolutely amazing surface that's really resurfaced 600 million years ago why is our neighboring planet so different why is it that we're not putting way more attention and effort to explore this planet? Yes, it's hard. It's hot on the surface. But, oh, no, we have to go to the easy places like Mars again <laughs> and again and again and again. <laughs> and let's go somewhere a lot more interesting and difficult. Well, are there, no, are there any serious discussions feel. about doing that, though? I mean, are, <laughs> what, what's being seriously contemplated by NASA is actually – going to happen i agree i think it's all it is something we should definitely do and i know i should get david grinspoon on here one day and talk about venus yes. with us but uh the, we need you know what what's actually being discussed at nasa right now so let me mention because david grinspoon is a member of my team and we proposed a venus lander called visage the venus in situ atmospheric and geophysical explorer and that would be a mission that would land on venus descend through the atmosphere and take one of those next steps to understanding some of those questions that Fran discussed, not just about the Earth in comparison to Mars, but about extrasolar planets that may be like the Earth or Mars or like Venus. So David Grinspoon is a member of the team who's leading up the astrobiological investigations that we carry out on this mission. And this is one of 12 ideas that NASA is now considering for a future mission, and they'll probably select three or more this year to study better and one eventually to fly. And that includes future missions to Saturn, maybe to Titan, uh, also to smaller bodies. But in in the mix, it's possible that NASA could select one of a number of well-planned missions to go back to Venus. And, and Carol, I just want to ask you: did, How does this? Do these missions that they're talking about, and ones for the planets like uh, Juno and and Galileo in the past, and 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 Cassini, they they don't really fit into the decadal survey much, do or do they? I mean, I'm trying to. We have this decadal survey where we look at different missions yeah. and and we propose for them, but these these are different, aren't they? As far well, as NASA. Okay, so each discipline has a decadal survey. So oh, okay. The one you're thinking of is the astrophysics. That's the one that has Hubble, you know, continue operation. W Hubble, first, all that. So, okay. Sure, yeah, make sure you launch Davis T, maybe do W first, that kind of stuff. That's all in astrophysics. So the, the planet, the solar system division has their own. Ah. Yeah, so we've been, we were a bit slow in solar system getting started. So we're behind the Astros. And so some of the earlier stuff was not decadal survey because we didn't have decadal surveys at the time of Galileo and so on and so forth. But the current decadal survey uh, has prioritized Mars yet again (laughs) and um, uh, uh, Europa, but also mentions uh, as competed missions the New Frontiers line, the priorities of. Um, uh, Venus, Uranus, and Neptune, and and some other targets. So um, they they are mentioned and discussed and prioritized. Yeah. All right. 
Well, I'm going to have to leave it with that, folks. We are out of time. Voyager, 40 years. Great stuff came out of it. Great stuff still coming out of these missions. And I wish I could get you guys in like 12 more hangouts because I want to talk about Cassini. I want to talk about right. uh, I want to talk about Juno and all of these other stuff. So I hope we can get you guys to come back and talk. We got to get David on and talk about Venus and and get and get that so, going. So just as a parting shot, because this picture is public, I'm sharing it. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Wow, look at that. <laughs> yep. I, re I, re that I remember was a long that. time. 1990. I remember them then. <laughs> yes. We were just trying to yeah. get the Pluto sure missions started. Is that Alan? Right, that's Alan exactly. Stern that on the Alan Stern. That's Alan Stern on the <laughs> left. Wow. America, that's... Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think Larry was, was on his thesis. Right right so, um, yeah, that's yeah, about them. I didn't find one of Larry to embarrass him. But anyway. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what cool. it takes, folks, to be a planetary astronomer. You start young and you work your whole career on missions that la that spend decades. Absolutely. So they were working on Pluto back Absolutely. then. Pluto, which we just went yes. past. Yes. So, okay, folks. Well, that is it. Thank you guys so much. Um, I hope you guys will join us next week. Next week, I've got three hangouts planned, Telescope Talk, uh, ExoLife Hangout, and Future in Space Hangout, where, we, where Harley has not told me yet <laughs> what the topic is. So I don't know yet what we're doing on next Thursday, but I will be back with uh, Adam Synergy and John Suffolk to talk about telescopes and we'll be talking about exo uh, life in the universe on the exo life hangout on Wednesday so I hope you guys will join us then I want to thank my guest Dr. Fran Bagnall and Dr. Larry Esposito yes. both of whom work at the Laboratory for Atmospheric and Space Physics at the University of Colorado my old alma mater and well it's not my old one it still is my alma mater uh, <laughs> and uh, these guys have uh, are the planetary scientists extraordinaire they've worked on a lot of different things Galileo we didn't even, I wanted to talk about Galileo too anyway Fran Larry I hope you come back all right thank you all so much for watching and as always keep looking keep up. looking up thank you bye bye bye, -bye. okay